Okay, um, guys, you can probably guess by the title of this video that I want to start off with an apology, because, um, as you know, I posted last night my, um, my review of Season 6, Episode 5 of Game of Thrones, and I posted it much quicker than I usually do, because I was very excited to just jump in and talk about it. But this excitement sort of, uh, <coughs> sorry, I think I might be getting sick, but this excitement sort of was, um, completely like occupying my mind like all i could think about was the episodes naturally i wanted to talk about it right away but um unfortunately this excitement got the better of me and allowed for i'd say a not that stellar review overall i feel like for one thing i forgot i completely forgot part of an arc in this episode that i want to um talk about this episode but i thought i'd make i mean this review i thought i'd make this this sort of follow-up video to sort of follow up my review and sort of clarify talk about some things I missed, um, elaborate more on certain things, and just get um, some more ideas out there about the episode, because I feel like my review didn't do as good of a job of doing so as I would have liked it to. So um, hopefully, I don't. I hope I don't have to make videos like this in the future, I hope my reviews are pretty comprehensive, but I feel like this might be a good solution to combat any non-comprehensiveness or non-clarity in the future. So I'm hoping this... Um, this works out in that way. So anyway, um, I mean, Jim, let me start off by the arc that I completely forgot. Um, the Greyjoy arc was continued in this um, episode. So um, we, uh, when when they announced like that there was going to be the King's Moon, I heard about. I've been heard about this event in the books. I've never read it. I haven't read that part, obviously, but um, I've heard about it, and it was really hyped up for me. So I was expecting. Um, I was expecting a lot more than it was. I thought it was going to be a battle, first of all, or some sort of series of like games or challenges. Violent games and challenges, but some sort of series of games and challenges and whoever won would be crowned king. I didn't realize that it was sort of almost a demo like uh, sham democracy in a way. So how it works is that they pretty much say their points, debate a little bit with each other, and then... It's voted upon based on it's voted upon around the people around him. I assume these people are all like sort of with, related to the royal family in some way, like sort of connected with that, but um, may not be. Um, I don't know. This could be just all the citizens of the Iron Islands. I don't. I doubt that. But um, so what happens is um, we see that. Um, and this was a little weird for me that Theon was eagerly supporting his sister, obviously, because he doesn't want to rule. He's not fit to rule. Um, his sister is probably the most fit to rule, so um, le least selfish and the most fit, I'd say. So, so he's going to swear, but the way he speaks and the way he talks means he got over Ramsay very quickly. Like, I thought his character would never be able to recover, but it seems like he really is. He, obviously, he's not as confident as he used to be, much less for that matter. But um, it seems like he's starting to recover in very big leaps. And that was a little strange to me, but hey, they're expediting the story in the show. Obviously, we've seen they're going very fast in the sh in the show. So maybe it takes them a lot longer in the books to recover. I mean, for the first part, I've heard that um, Theon is even there. He's still with Ramsay when the kingdom actually happens. So they probably have to figure something out and how to add him or incorporate him. Um... Because everyone still looks up the Theon as being like the one that should lead them, but he's not fit at all. Yara is really the only fit one, but um... So, pretty much, um, Euron comes out and just admits to killing the King of the Iron Islands and I don't know whose name escapes me. And they all just kind of support him. Hold up there. So, if everyone's cheering when he talks about how he killed him, how fucked was this king? He didn't seem that bad. He was an asshole, but he didn't seem that bad. So... But, um, who knows? Maybe he could have been, like, an extreme tyrannical dick, and we just didn't see him a lot. Like, we've, we've been focusing on Joffrey Ramsey, like, as, as Stannis, like, as different king characters. So, who knows? Maybe, um, maybe he was a complete dick. But, um, anyway, so, yeah, so, that sort of happened, and everyone sort of supported, um, Euron, so they sort of just kind of, um, they did the Drown God procedure which is if you drown him and he comes back to life it means that he's chosen so they did that with him he was crowned king and um we see that um we see that theon and yara just stole the fleet and 
are kind of just either running away or preparing for battle. They're going to leave and then come back to attack once they get more men. Um, I don't know if that's what's going to be. It's going to be one or the other. Not really sure fully exactly yet, but um, who knows. Sorry about that. The lighting got a little off, so I thought I'd just stop and switch it. But um, yeah, so we don't really know what's going on there, but we hear, so Euron has a plan. He's um he's pretty much taken I think part um I think there's a character in the books, correct me if I'm wrong, called Victorion, Victorion Greyjoy, who they in this show they pretty much combine Euron and Victorion. So he's doing Victorion's role, which is he's going to sail to um, Essos and Marine probably and try to get um try to get um, Daenerys as their ally to take back, take Westeros for themselves. Which obviously we know Daenerys is not gonna take any of his shit. However, if he offers a fleet that he gathers and builds, he orders everyone to build his fleet. If he offers this nice fleet for Daenerys to have more ships, especially since her ships were burned, maybe she'll be more willing to work with him. However, it's going to take a lot of persuasion from Daenerys, since she already has a huge army and has possibly other means of getting ships in the east. So it's going to be, um, it's going to take a lot of persuasion. But, um... So that's that arc. I pretty much covered the rest of the arcs um, pretty solidly. Not much happens other than, and I, I obviously still want to clarify more on what I thought of the whole Bran storyline because I rushed kind of through it and was a little incohesive. But um, so, so pretty much, um, I just want to talk about how well shot and directed that scene was. The whole final action piece of this episode. It was probably one of the. It was probably the best battle scene in the entire show thus far um it was the this it was it was sort of a very big turning point for the show and even though it only really involved um like four main characters in somewhere far off that nobody really knows this is happening um except probably i'm going to assume that um melisandre and maybe the other red priestess in the east saw this uh, there's no way of knowing, but, um, yeah, so we really, it was really something very small, but very big at the same time, and I feel like, I haven't really felt this watching a show since the Ruby Volume 3 finale, where everything changes now, and it's not even everything changes, because things are going to go back to the way they were, but there's always going to be that suspicion in your mind that, hey, this shit happened, so... I don't know if the brand storyline is done for the season. I really hope not, because I really want them to clarify more about it. And um, a lot of people are trying to figure out how the warging situation works. I think my personal opinion on what happened was that he tried to work into into present Hodor, but because past Hodor was there and he was in the past, he accidentally warged into both. And I feel like that him warging, being inside this person at two different points in life completely destroyed his brain. That's what I think happened. And so because cause the brain was operating in the future and the past, so the future stuff was going into the past, and vice versa, and that completely fucked up the wires or whatever, the, the, the structure of his brain, and just destroyed and that's where that came from, that character came from. And, um, and just the way they composed the whole final scene with um, Blood Raven 9 was very cool. It was definitely reminding me of Voldemort's death in Deathly Hollows, even though, as far as we know, the Blood Raven is a good guy. Um, so, but it definitely reminded me that it definitely felt zero. It's just, um, just to explain, it's a very powerful, magical f person dying. So they kind of sort of have to, I'm going to adjust the screen a little here take that um but yeah so it's a very powerful magical person dying so they kind of have that same kind of um dynamic there but that's pretty much the most they have in common as we know so far so the whole final scene was expertly crafted it was very well shot it had you on the edge of your seat like the entire time i was like holding on to the chair and i'm like the entire scene like i was shaking that's how like tense the scene was and the tension really, really paid off, and it was, in my opinion, one of, if not the best constructed scene in the entirety of the show. Um, it was tremendous. I, I felt like cla like I was considered like I felt like clapping after the episode ended. That's how that's how good it was. Like if I saw that in theaters, like I would a hundred percent be like, um, yeah. And the last time I really felt like clapping from something. 
Uh, Moving on, I forget I would have clapped if I wasn't on crying, but uh, hysterically crying. But um, the last time I clapped or something like that is The Force Awakens, and I just stood up and was like, "That's exactly how I felt after this episode. It was just tremendous, and the way the whole final sequence of the episode was, yeah, like I said, the best shot scene in the show probably. And um, so. This does, there is uh, some inconsistencies in the timeline with the books and the show with regards to the ancient stuff with Leaf being alive. But, um, who cares? Who the fuck cares, really? It doesn't, I certainly don't. They can modify it a little bit with the show. I, I give them a lot of leeway. Um, yeah, I don't really care. So, if anyone's gonna bitch and whine about that, it's not gonna be me. But, um, so yeah, um, so I felt bad because. She was pretty much, I think she was the, unless, like, like I said, unless there's some sort of colony of children in the forest that we don't really know about yet, somewhere else at Westeros, maybe farther north, maybe in the far east, um, the children of the forest are extinct, and I felt like the last one to go to Leaf was pretty, pretty, not bad from the writing standpoint, but literally a waste, because she sacrificed herself to buy them time, but bought them literally a couple of seconds, like, and if you think about it, those couple of seconds may have saved their asses in the end, but I don't think it was enough to warrant a, a sacrifice of the last of a species. And, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't really know. There could be another colony. We don't really know. But, um, that's as far as we do know. They're extinct. And that's fucked. Because now what's going to happen to the wall? Because the wall, um, I don't know if it still is, but it's pretty, um, it's, it was, it was, it's being held up. By children of the forest magic that's what's protecting that's why the um the white walkers can't get in because of the children of the forest magic so now that they're gone um does that mean the white walkers can just destroy it or does the magic still stay despite the last child of the forest dying that's a question we're going to find out probably this season and I'm worried what's going to happen, what I think is going to happen, at least in my opinion, is that while John's busy, while John and um, Sansa are busy fighting at Winterfell, um, the White Walkers are going to come and destroy the Wall and enter Westeros, which would fuck everyone. Yeah, that, and then that's what I think is going to happen there. But, um, so, but we really don't know, um... This was, this this episode felt like such a season finale. Like I could so see a season ending here, but it didn't. It's just we're still five episodes left of this season. This was just the mid season finale, and that's insane to me. Like if this was the mid season finale, what does the ser- season finale have to offer? And that's why I'm saying maybe it's the wall being destroyed. I'm expecting the final scene of this season to be the wall being destroyed and the White Walkers entering Westeros, but um, there's no way of knowing obviously um but yeah I, I i mean we now know how the white walkers were created we now know which was a very interesting thing because that theory has been going around recently that the white walkers like popularity in like the last past few weeks the white walkers um were created by the children of the forest to defeat the humans but then they got out of hand and the children of the forest eventually got to ally themselves with the humans to do so but um so that's pretty much it that's my clarifications i wanted to make i hope i don't have to make videos like this in the future but um i just wanted to sort of this is sort of my apology for a lackluster review and i hope you can understand that and i hope you guys can forgive me but um yeah that's about it so thanks guys for watching and i'll see you guys next time